American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about Father Pierre Jean de Smet, a native of Belgium who did more than anyone else to evangelize the American Indians west of the Mississippi and to broker peace among tribes and between the Indians and the U.S. government. He was a remarkable man. I'm actually shocked there isn't a cause open for his canonization. In pursuit of souls to baptize and evangelize, he traveled more than 180,000 miles in his life, going all over the land between St. Louis, Missouri, the Pacific coast of Oregon, well up into Canada, traversing Utah, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, the Dakotas, and all regions in between, most of it on a mule. He also made 19 trips back to Europe, mostly to raise funds for the missions and to bring back more missionaries to support the work. And he did it all with a childlike simplicity and love of nature that was reminiscent of St. Francis of Assisi. So let's get into his story. He was born in Belgium in 1801. Right, in the central Belgian town of Dendermond. He grew up within the context of the Napoleonic Wars and entered the Jesuit seminary at 19 years old. Within about 18 months of his entering, the seminary was visited by Father Charles Nerinx. Nerinx was a fellow Belgian who had come to the United States in 1804 to serve as a missionary. Once here in the U.S., he was assigned to be a missionary in Kentucky. You mean the Kentucky Holy Land? Yes. He did work around Loretto and Bardstown, which are two places we will be visiting on pilgrimage this August. Everyone should join us. Get details at our new website, AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash pilgrimages. Father Nerinx founded the Sisters of Loretto, among other things, so you'll see the fruits of his labors on this pilgrimage for sure. But the fruit of his labor that we're talking about today is one particular missionary whom he brought back with him, Pierre-Jean de Smet. Because when Father Nerinx sailed back to the U.S. in 1821, de Smet was among the 11 Jesuit novices who accompanied him. Desmet joined the Jesuit community at White Marsh in Maryland. In 1823, he was sent west to complete his novitiate and theological studies at Florissant, Missouri, a tiny town just north of St. Louis. We talked about Florissant before in episode 50. That's where St. Rose Philippine de Chen had built her monastery and had begun teaching Indian children. She was there in Florissant when the Jesuits were sent out. And this group of Jesuits went out to that remote land for a similar reason, to establish their religious community there and to become familiar with the Indian populations so that they might evangelize them. And Mother Duchenne helped the Jesuits to establish their first home in Missouri for this purpose. Do you remember what the natives called Mother Duchenne later in her life? Yeah, it was women who prays always because she could never quite learn their language, so she just stayed in the chapel and prayed for them. I wouldn't be surprised if some of her prayers were answered in the person of Father de Smet. Yeah, it seems likely, because while Duchenne's lifelong dream was to evangelize the natives, de Smet actually did that, and he did it in ways that no one else achieved before or really since him. You're not kidding, but we're getting slightly ahead of ourselves. So Desmet was ordained in Missouri in 1827 and began his Jesuit career by helping to establish a number of schools and seminaries in the area in and around St. Louis. It was while serving in these roles that he first became exposed significantly to American Indians and their customs. In 1833, he became an American citizen but that same year, he had to return to Belgium due to some health problems. He returned to Missouri in 1837. Immediately upon his return, he was sent to Pottawatomie Territory, northwest of St. Louis, along the Missouri River. The specific place where he set up shop is in present-day Council Bluffs, Iowa. There he helped establish the Mission of St. Joseph, and he remained there for a few years. The Potawatomi were a tribe originally from the upper Midwest. Many of them had previously converted to Catholicism due to the missionary work of French Jesuits from Canada. Over the first few decades of the 1800s, most of them had been forced off their tribal lands by the U.S. government. Many left of their own volition, but there were some who refused to just leave and were force marched by the army. We talked about this, the Potawatomi Trail of Death, in episode 48. 
The Trail of Death actually happened in 1838, so at about the same time that Father DeSmet was establishing the St. Joseph Mission in present-day Council Bluffs. I wonder how much the terrible treatment of the Potawatomi by the army shaped his later treatment of and relationship with the various natives he would meet over the rest of his life. I imagine it made an impression on him and how he approached peace negotiations in the future. He knew the extent to which the government would go to get their way. But he very much had a heart for the Indians, and his dedication to their good really comes through in his writings. Oh yeah. Throughout his travels and his missionary work, he wrote extensively about his experiences. He wrote movingly about the various Indian tribes and their customs, how they received him, their simplicity of faith, and how dearly they loved God, whom they called the Great Spirit. But his writings didn't focus only on the Indians. He also wrote about the world around him in great detail and sweeping narrative. His descriptions of the vistas he saw and the wonders of nature that he experienced have a childlike simplicity and beauty about them that is just delightful. And through it all, it is clear that Christ is his motivation. He loved God's creation and delighted in it. He loved Christ and wanted to spread the gospel to those who hadn't heard it yet. He wanted to see peace among peoples, and he pursued it. It wasn't long after the Potawatomi Trail of Death before he had an opportunity to go be the missionary he wanted to be. In 1839, a delegation of Salish Indians arrived in St. Joseph. The Salish were seeking black robes, that is, Jesuits, to come minister in their camps. The Salish were a semi-nomadic people based in the mountains of what is today southwestern Montana and southeastern Idaho. They had learned of Christ from some Iroquois hunters who had come to live with them and had married some of their women. Those Iroquois, in turn, were from tribes near the Great Lakes, and they had been evangelized in the 1600s by French Jesuits. But the Salish had never had a priest among them, and thus never had any of the sacraments. A rash of illness that was ravaging their people prompted them to follow the advice of their Christian Iroquois brethren and to seek the assistance that they believed the black robes could offer. So they sent delegations to Bishop Joseph Rosati in St. Louis, 1,300 miles away. The first two delegations made it to St. Louis, and Bishop Rosati promised both delegations that he would send missionaries as soon as it was financially possible. But that day didn't come. So in time, the Salish sent a third delegation, but that one was set upon and massacred by a band of Sioux. The fourth delegation, sent in 1839, made it as far as the St. Joseph Mission, where they met Father DeSmet. He was personally interested in their play and saw their arrival as the work of God. He joined them in their journey to St. Louis, where he met with Bishop Rosati and volunteered to be one of those missionaries sent to the Salish. Bishop Rosati agreed, and Father Desmet's life work was set. He set off for the Salish lands. On this first trip, he traveled with a fur trading company's armed brigade for safety. Like we said, there were Sioux warriors around who were hostile to all who were not Sioux. Along the way, on July 5th, 1840, he offered the first Mass in present-day Wyoming, about a mile from a town called Daniel. When they arrived in the Salish camp in Pierre's Hole on the eastern edge of present-day Idaho, he immediately set to baptizing and assessing needs. He baptized about 350 Salish and neighboring Pend d'Oreille people before departing to report back to Bishop Rosati about the great need and to make more plans for more permanent missionary activities. Early in 1841, he returned with two other priests and three friars. This time, he did not travel with an armed brigade, and never again did he feel the need to travel armed to the hilt for his own protection. He didn't feel the need to. He trusted in God's providence. He trusted that if it were God's will that he should die, then that would be the best thing for him. He trusted that if it were God's will that he should live, then he would survive. He was simple in this way like San Francis. The simplicity also probably made it easier for him to put people at ease and establish friendship. Once in Salish territory, they established the mission of St. Mary in the Bitterroot Valley of western Montana. That first mission remained his most treasured work throughout his life, and it still stands today. He stayed at St. Mary for a few years. While staying at St. Mary, he took some time to travel even further west, going all the way to Fort Vancouver in present-day Washington State. There he met three important Catholics. The first two were Fathers Modeste Demers and Francois Blachet, two very important missionaries who would eventually be bishops in that region. Both of them also figure in the story of Archbishop Charles John Sagers, the Apostle to Alaska, whom we talked about in Episode 18. 
Sagers didn't arrive in the Pacific Northwest until the 1860s, but it is likely that once Sagers arrived, Desmet and Sagers knew each other. They certainly knew of one another. They both loved the natives dearly and had hearts for mission among all the people. Probably. And the third important Catholic was John McLaughlin, the larger-than-life man who was the chief factor for the Hudson's Bay Company in that region, which the British called the Columbia District. This made McLaughlin the most important and powerful man in the Pacific Northwest. We told McLaughlin's incredible story in episode 55. I'm sensing a pattern here. This met connects everybody. <laughs> yes. McLaughlin was a colorful figure with a commanding presence and a knack for doing big things and making great friends and great enemies. And Father Desmet, he found a friend because McLaughlin, like Desmet, wanted to see the Catholic faith flourish in the region. The message Father Desmet got from all three men was that Protestant missionaries were rapidly moving into the territory and making things difficult for Catholics. McLaughlin encouraged him to work as hard as he could to convert the natives before the Protestants got to them. Demers and Blanchet told him that the Protestants already had influenced the nearby Nez Perce tribe and made them skeptical of Catholics. Father Desmet seemingly took this as a challenge, but in the most lighthearted and matter-of-fact way. Upon hearing that the Nez Perce had been warned against Catholics, he promptly invited some Nez Perce to come stay at St. Mary's. By the time they left to return to their own tribe, they had all been baptized Catholic. He was an incredible man of faith, hard work with joy, and accomplishment. One fellow traveler said of him, He was genial, of fine presence, and one of the saintliest men I have ever known, and I cannot wonder that the Indians were made to believe him divinely protected. He was a man of great kindness and great affability under all circumstances. Nothing seemed to disturb his temper. Sometimes a cart would go over, breaking everything in it to pieces, and at such times Father Desmet would be just the same, beaming with good humor. This demeanor had a way of disarming people and drawing them in. He had this effect on natives everywhere he went. For the next few years, his time was spent in any of a very few activities, establishing missions among the natives and leaving them in the capable hands of fellow missionaries, mapping the land, his maps were very accurate and used for a long time, traveling to cities in the East and in Europe to raise funds and find additional missionaries, and brokering peace between the tribes. In 1844, he traveled to Belgium, where he raised money, recruited Jesuit missionaries, and convinced the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur to send a group of sisters with him to the Pacific Northwest, where they established a convent in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. From there, he made a tremendous journey up the Columbia River, up into Canada near present-day Banff, Alberta, and then after staying in Canada for the winter, he came back down into the United States. On this very long journey, he encountered thousands of natives, and he evangelized and baptized unknown numbers of them. In his writings, he recounts the story of baptizing a very elderly couple who had heard about Christianity and who had always tried in their own lives to be good followers of the Great Spirit. They had ardently hoped that a black robe would come to them before they died, and their joy was immense when Father happened upon them. They eagerly received instruction and were baptized before Father continued on his way. Shortly after telling that story, Father Desmet wrote in his memoir, These little adventures are our great consolation. I would not have exchanged my situation at that moment for any other on earth. I was convinced that such incidents alone were worth a journey to the mountains. Ah, good and dear fathers who may read these lines, I conjure you, through the mercy of our divine Redeemer, not to hesitate entering this vineyard. Its harvest is ripe and abundant. Does not our Savior tell us, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and would that it were already kindled? It is amidst the poor tribes of these isolated mountains that the fire of divine grace burns with ardor. Superstitious practices have disappeared, nor have they amongst them the castes of East India. Speak to these savages of heavenly things. At once their hearts are inflamed with divine love, and immediately they go seriously about the great affair of their salvation. Day and night they are at our sides, insatiable for the bread of life. Often on retiring we hear them say, Our sins, no doubt, rendered us so long unworthy to hear these consoling words just beautiful. We'll include a link to where the complete text of his account of his many journeys can be read online. It's really wonderful and amazing the way he talks about the nature around him, the people he met, and how much he loves what he is doing. It's just so heartwarming. But his time as an active missionary was not to last. 
1846, his superiors made him responsible for fundraising and recruiting for the missions, and the U.S. government began to solicit his assistance in negotiating with the tribes. Both saw the authority that Father Desmet had among the many Indian tribes and the credibility he brought to the effort to evangelize and to bring peace to the region. He filled both roles as best he could. In the case of raising money and recruiting missionaries for the work of evangelization, well, that was easy. He did it gladly, traveling all over the East and multiple times back to Europe. In the case of aiding the U.S. government in negotiating peace with the Indians, well, he was clear when he could and when he could not offer his assistance because he would not compromise himself. It was simple. He would work for peace, but he would not negotiate in bad faith or tell the Indians something that he knew to be untrue. During one major treaty gathering in 1851, the Indians described him as the white man whose tongue does not lie. He was instrumental in helping that negotiation come to a peaceful conclusion. He traveled with the army as a chaplain for a time in the 1850s, aiding them in their campaign against Brigham Young and the Mormons in Utah. But shortly after that, he withdrew his cooperation when he perceived that their next mission was to be a punitive one against some Indians. The most important treaty negotiation of his life happened toward the end, in 1868. The Sioux had been a constant problem for settlers and the U.S. government, and the government wished to negotiate a peace treaty with them. But when the U.S. delegation of peace commissioners reached the edge of the territory controlled by the Sioux, the government delegates would go no further for fear of their lives. Father DeSmet alone entered that territory and traveled the many hundreds of miles north to the main Sioux camp in Canada. There he met personally with the Sioux chief, Sitting Bull. Very much like St. Francis of Assisi going to see the Sultan of Egypt to broker peace during the Crusades. I know, right? Like we've been saying, just a childlike trust in God's providence. And Sitting Bull received him enthusiastically and listened gravely to his counsels. The result of his mediation was that Sitting Bull sent all of his chiefs to the treaty negotiations at Fort Laramie, where all of them signed on. This was considered the most significant achievement in the Indian Wars. But probably even more significant to Father DeSmet was that two years later, in 1870, he returned to Sioux country to establish a mission among that people. After establishing this mission, he returned to St. Louis, and he died in Florissant, Missouri, on May 23, 1873. He had lived a life poured out for Christ. He had traveled all over seeking souls. He had braved every danger and risked his life many times to share the light of Christ. He had seen some of the most beautiful natural sights on earth and had witnessed some of the most beautiful moments in people's lives. There was hardly a tribe of Indians west of the Mississippi that he did not meet, befriend, and evangelize. There was no greater friend to the American Indian, and there is no way to know the number of souls who owe their knowledge of Christ and his church to the tireless ministration of Father Pierre-Jean de Smet. You've been listening to American Catholic History, produced by the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please help us out by giving us a five-star rating and a good review, and we ask you to consider supporting the work of SQPN. Yes, now is a great time to become a StarQuest patron. Thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter, when you start a new Patreon monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give, the first three months will be matched by an equal amount from our donor to support all of our shows, including American Catholic History, making your gift go even further. And we're more than halfway to our goal of $2,000 in new monthly pledges. Won't you help us close the gap? If you've been thinking of becoming a StarQuest patron, now is the time. Visit sqpn.com slash give today. To learn more about Father Pierre Jean de Smet, to find previous episodes, or to learn about our upcoming pilgrimages to unforgettable American Catholic holy sites, please visit our American Catholic History website, americancatholichistory.org. We also love feedback and hearing about great Catholic history sites and stories from all over. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow StarQuest on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, produced by StarQuest.